these guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to try talking here. Now, is, can anyone hear me? Yes. I'm going to ask if Matt can hear me. You're all good, Warren. Okay, um, my name is Martin Allen Cooper. Um, I've been working fish passage for 33 years. And really, I started with John in New South Wales Fisheries. So, John and I have 10 years together. And now, I've been a consultant for 23 years. So, you actually have three generations of fish passage here after being the youngest one. Now, so, um, most of my work has been in Australia, at least in Australia. I've worked on about 230 fish passage projects. Um, in the last five, ten years, I spent more time in Mekong, working in Cambodia and Laos. Uh, about 90 of my paid work now is in, uh, in the Mekong, and there are big projects and big fish passage issues. Um, I wear a few different hats. I'm a consultant, but I also work uh, with Charles Sturt University. I have a couple of students there. I've done like some of my Lao research with Charles Sturt. And I'm also on the board of Boss Fish Unlimited, which are recreational fishermen trying to improve fish habitat. So that's my background. Um, so today, or tonight, I'm just going to have two major components, a very broad overview of fishway types, thinking that some of you may not have seen uh, that range of fishway types, and I probably will miss out on some along the way. Uh, and then some broad principles of fishway design. And this comes also down to two components. So one is this integration of biology, hydrology, and hydraulics. And this is fundamental. So I'm going to you know, tease it out a bit and show you how that, uh, how that links and how we use that in fish weight design. Um, then in actual design, the fish passage, people uh, often zoom in on the hydraulic design of a channel and, uh, and you go to a fishway and you see an actual you know, passage of water with baffles and you zoom in on that. There are two components to this line. One is attraction and the second is passage. So you need to get the fish to the fishway before you want to use it. And that's very important. And I'll expand on that. Now, I'm always going to break with convention. I'm going to start with my conclusion. <laughs> because it's very straightforward and it is a, a really important thing. It's a team approach. So I, I work with engineers all the time. I work in a team all the time. I work with hydrologists, engineers. I never, ever work on my own on fish weight design. So I'm going to start with my conclusion. OK, so let's just look at a broad range of fish weight types. And, um, and this is not all of them. Uh, but th these are the major ones that you'll see in Australia. So the vertical slot fishway, I'll show you photographs of all of these. Uh, cone fishway, trapezoidal weirs, the rock ramp, and in Europe they're called nature light fishways, Daniel fishway, and John touched on some high level fishways, which are fish locks, fish lips, and trap and transport. I'm going to add a fish pump to that too. At the bottom there, I put downstream. So we we tend to focus a lot on upstream fish passage, but as John you know, gave us that, that biological outline, it's cyclic migration. It's upstream and downstream. I'll just touch on that and flag it because that's another whole talk, but you need to keep that in mind if you're ever dealing with fish passage. Now, those top three there, they're pull type fishways, and uh, I'll show you what I mean by that. So, Here's a, a vertical stop fishway. Essentially, the water flow is through a series of pools. And pool top fishways have been around for guess, over 100 years. Um, and this one's very widely used because the water flows through a vertical slot between each of those pools. And it dissipates the turbulence very well. It adjusts to very heavy water, tar water, which is you know, Australia's very hydrology. So this has been you know, widely applied, and uh, in fact, John mentioned George Ike, this consultant who, who came here, and he recommended this design, and it has been you know, widely applied since. Now, that, um, you know, there, there are probably over 70 vertical fishways, possibly, in eastern Australia, um, actually in other, other states <coughs> as well, in South Australia, Western Australia, not sure about Tasmania. But yeah, on that left hand uh, side you can see a high river flow, you can have you know, high depth of water, 
and then in labor of flow it still operates. So in variable head water, if it's in phase, in variable tail water, it operates really well and has very consistent hydraulics. And I'm going to deal with that later on because hydraulics are very important, just internal hydraulics. Um, now, that was the classical design and uh, that has now had a number of important variations. And so that slot was originally just a straight open slot. Now that has multiple different shapes and that comes from uh, some research we did on the May River that showed that the energy of the water in that pool, the amount of turbulence in that pool was as important as water velocity. And in fish passage, you often talk about swimming speeds, you often see it in the literature, but that turbulence and how that's dissipated is very, very important. And there's a few papers on that, uh, but uh, yeah, don't just focus on water velocity and any of that turbulence, it's measured in watts per cubic metre, there are formula out there. But the vertical slot now comes with different variations to suit different hydrology and also different fish species. So, if you've got large fish, you want a wide slot, you have a very low, um, very low discharge, you will narrow the slot. So you adjust this to the river system and, and the sort of biology and the size of fish that move. Um, a dual vertical slot fishway, this is hard, hard to get a good photograph of this, but at the top there, uh, there's water going from the top to the bottom on that left hand side, and the jets hit each other and then move into those uh, the slots. So it was same as the previous slide, but just double. Um, but it was the original vertical slot fishway. It's been used um, you know, famously in the US, and it's just a, another style. Really. Uh, so this is another pool and weird type uh, hydraulics, pool and weird type fishway, comb fishway that Tim Marsden developed in Queensland. It's been used in a number of places in Queensland. And it's been quite effective for small fish um, at specific sites. Um, it has a narrow headwater range. You can imagine if the water was higher, uh, some cones would drown out. So these fishways have different uh, applicabilities to different sites. So small fish and narrow headwater range, well, this is a good option. This is a design by Heath Robertson, which you hand up there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and this, this is interesting because uh, we had a lot of rock ramp fishways, and the rock ramp fishways have uh, sometimes unpredictable hydraulics. This has very consistent hydraulics, so this might be called a hybrid fishway. It has consistent vertical slot type hydraulics in this rocky channel, very effective, it controls turbulence and uh, produces a good attraction flow. Um, this is another type of fishway that I've developed for Wild, uh, north of here. And uh, this, th this is actually interesting. I talked. To, I started with a team approach. This is um, comes. It should be. It should be a video. Mm, I have to manually test it out. Videos are always problematic. Okay, just imagine the water flow is rushing down from the middle. And it's got sound, it sounds fantastic. But this is interesting because this was, uh, we started uh, with uh, a team where we said we wanted a simple small vertical soft fish way. But there are other, other objectives. One was gauging. And we need to have very good gauging. I wanted to get the traction flow beside the fishway and the council wanted to be uh, pretty well maintenance free because if it started to get blocked up with, uh, with leaves and sticks that would affect their gauging and this engagement is very, very important. So we really worked around this and so this, this particular structure has a steel back on the top that rates very, very well. Small debris goes down the middle and on the sides very low turbulence for fish. Now, large fish go straight through the middle and the small fish go through the sides. So that for me was a really interesting process because we, uh, we talked about what the different objectives were, we came up with a different design, 
actually, and we said, look, we're not sure how this will work. Let's do a model. So in fact, the client was great, the physical model, and uh, that's been working pretty well. So th then we come to this group of, of uh, rock ramp or nature-like fishways, and these come in these three different uh, types. And, and you'll, you'll often hear um, you know, rock ramp fishways, they're all natural, and you, you think if it's all natural, it's going to be like, you know, awesome yoga or something, it's going to be fantastic. These are highly variable in their performance, and their build can be highly variable. So this can be fantastic, some of the best fishways, and they can also be not very good. So at the best end, a full width rock ramp fishway extends across the entire river channel, and therefore, hopefully, if it's well built, it's just like a ripple, and fish will use it at low flows, and then high flows, you've got roughness on the sides, and then fish using the, you know, the, the rocks on the side. If these are well built, these are an excellent fish way. Um, a couple of issues, uh, the toe can erode, if you've got soft sediments downstream, if that starts to erode, well then it'll eat away the large rocks and they drop. Um, placement of the rocks, uh, really large rocks probably need to be you know, embedded in about half of their mass, as an example. There's certain criteria around it, but it can be a very, very effective fish way. So, so this is also a rock ramp fish way, but this is a partial with rock ramp fish way. So this one's a, a Rimba Weir, uh, north of Sydney. And so this is a channel that's going around the side, and the entrance ends up at the face of the weir. And when there's a bit more flow, the weir starts to spill, and the entrance is still good. But at high flows, and the high flows at this site get bigger bass migrate, migrating, the entrance gets drowned out, it gets further and further away from the weir. So it becomes less effective at high flows. Now that can suit some sites. So you need to just know what the priority is in terms of fish migration and flows. So these just have different strengths. Um, and this is one that I did the concept for and Heath Robinson did the engineering for. So this is um, also a fantastic video that's not working. But, uh, so, so this is a partial width rock ramp fishway, but it's recessed into the weir pool. So as the tar water comes up, the entrance is the same location. In this case, the entrance on the left hand side, the downstream on the left hand side, and it has a convex shape, so it has a greater headwater range. So you can modify this. Um, it's a pity you're not going to see it. Anyway, just imagine flowing the uh, Nature-like bypass channels. Uh, so this is actually a channel right around the structure. Um, again, these can have a narrow headwater range and narrow tidewater range. You have some designs, but very effective. You know, within those uh, you know, those requirements. Very widely used in Europe, in Germany and Austria, and a certain extent in France. Um, again, th these are sites very consistent headwater and uh, also they're sometimes used to compensate the loss of flowing water habitat. So the weir pools inundated riffles. Sometimes these are on very low gradients, like you know, one in two hundred, and they're trying to recreate the riffles and recreate the habitat. So they serve two functions, habitat and beach <coughs> passage. And the Deniel, this was uh, originally uh, developed in about 1909 by Gustave Deniel, a Belgian who worked in France. And this has this is essentially a systematically roughened channel, lots of closely spaced uh, you know, baffles, and uh, water runs down these baffles and creates a counter current at the bottom, low velocity. Um, these are also effective within a narrow headwater range, um, and then if it gets too deep, they get too fast. But and also they're not good for surface surface fish. They're very good for bottom drilling fish. But again, uh, you know, I've had very good success with under the right conditions. And I'll use those in a few sites. Um, culverts. I'm only going to touch on gold culverts, and actually, Matt's probably much more experienced in this uh, than I have. But, but uh, and, and, and John raised the issue about barriers. And often you would just drive over a road crossing and you won't get into the barrier, but frequently it is. And so uh, there's research to have been done with culverts to get fish through those. And the bottom right hand side, you can just see these vertical baffles underneath. And so the idea was to increase roughness and increase passage of fish through that. 
uh, floodgates. I haven't done any of these, but I know Matt has. You know, I think you've done some Matt. Yes. Some, yeah, some floodgates, uh, and, and these are a steady issue, especially on, on the north coast. Maybe Matt, Matt can expand on that, but yeah, another issue. So sometimes when the head difference across these is minimal, but still the gates are closed, so it's a matter of reopening them and allowing fish to go through at certain tides. And high level fish passage. So on the left is a fish lock. And these, these in principle, are pretty simple. The bottom gate closes, the chamber fills up, the top gate opens, and the fish swim out. This is, in principle, pretty simple. Now, surprisingly, uh, we've got quite a number of fish locks and, and uh, we've got a few fish loops, but you know, uh, and John, you, know, you sort of uh, talked a bit about this. We've had issues of reliability, and it should be pretty simple. And, and I know there's some uh, fish locks in the east coast of the US, and I know one in, the, in France, and um, it worked pretty well. There's some in Portugal that they don't, but we've had issues in Australia uh, with reliability, and, uh, and, and it's been disappointing, even though that actually there can be quite effective fish passage. So, um, that's that one here, we'll see. <coughs> there we go, fish lift comes into a, a bucket at the bottom, goes over the dam. Also, pretty, essentially pretty, pretty simple. I mean, if you get the fish <coughs> attracted to the bucket, very effective. So, so Talawa, I, I saw Talawa working, and I just, uh, when it was first commissioned, and we did a lot of physical modelling to get the entrance right, and I saw fish go into it, go up and over. The issue is the library, and uh, I'll probably pass that to this audience, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's about uh, you know, uh, mechanical issues, but uh, yeah, I think John will just take 40% of the time. So, so, so yes, sometimes I'm surprised. But they, they should be straightforward. The fish locks in particular should be straightforward. Fish locks are more complex, but, um, but, but that's our, our history at the moment. Here we've got about eight high-level locks. Uh, we've also used locks on low level weirs, on three metre high weirs on the Murray River, uh, lots two to six in South Australia. We've had dual fishways with a high grade vertical slot for large fish and a small fish lock for small fish. When it's working, it, it can pass you know, tens of thousands of small fish. And we just had an issue with the gates going. It looks like that's actually been solved by uh, SA water. Um, so Probably a good use of fish lots. We've got three fish lifts uh, in Australia, and of course, we haven't transported things in uh, that John did. So, and John mentioned this barrier removal. Your first choice, uh, probably always barrier removal. Interestingly, if you get a brief for a fishway, really, uh, the, the, the fishway is a tool to achieve certain outcomes. So, so you have to empathise with the client and what their outcomes are. And if they're out, and their outcomes are about, you know, restoring migration, actually even that's not an outcome. Your outcome is about improving fish populations or rehabilitating. So if you go in with that perspective, sometimes the simplest uh, solution is to, to remove that barrier. And I know that that's happened in you know, a couple of cases in uh, New South Wales where you might have thought a fishway was a better option. So it's, it's always worth, even that's not in the you know, canvassing that option. Now, I'm, I'm going to get a flag down from uh, migration because we've got you know, limited time. And, and there's a couple of just important things uh, here. One is that overshot gates uh, are better you know, than undershot. And you know, this is based on some research by Lee Bowengardner. And uh, the, the undershot actually causes pretty high mortalities. Fish. So gradually, with you know, in some infrastructure where I've been providing advice and others have been providing advice, we're gradually improving uh, that by providing overshot gates. But very, very simple, but we didn't have the knowledge, and we did this research which showed that. So that's a one important thing for downstream. And, and the other obvious one is a deep tar water is better than a shallow tar water. So uh, now there's been some physical modelling and uh, some CFD modelling around that. Um, you know, I know uh, he's been involved in some of that, Stephen Slark and the rest been involved in some of that. 
and uh, we've pretty well found if you use a tar water that's 40 percent of the total differential head uh, in the modeling it looks pretty good in the field it looks pretty good for safe for fish so that, that looks to be you know, a current guideline so that's two things just to get sent into the downstream it actually gets more complex when we talk about pumps you need screening or hydroelectricity you need more screening that's a whole other hour <laughs> but just keep in mind so there's some fishway types so so you've, you've been given a brief to design fishway you know what's the information you need and really you need, you need biology hydrology and hydraulics and you absolutely these are the building blocks you will need every single time whether you're dealing with a weir that's you know, 30 centimetres high or a dam that's 30 metres high, you will always, always approach it this way. And that will give you fish passage options. So, just to give you an overview of the basics of biology that you absolutely must have some idea of, you need to know what the smallest fish is because they will have the weakest swimming. Pool. So, that's important. You need to know what the largest fish is that, that you need to pass. And this, this may not be 100% of the population. As, as John said, we have, we have uh, talked about <coughs> passing, say, 95% of the population. You may, uh, you know, change that for different river systems. But the largest fish needs the greatest space in a fishway and the greatest depth. So you've got to start from that. So you might want a species list, but you really need to know what the smallest fish and the largest fish is you probably need to know something about the monetary environment. We haven't got good criteria for this, <coughs> but, some, but it's very obvious at some sites you get pulses of fish and you just get hundreds and hundreds of fish in very short periods of time. But we haven't got probably good criteria around that. And keep in mind there's upstream and downstream migration. So, You've got this data, you roughly know what sort of fish you're doing. You need to know now the hydrology, you need to link it with hydrology. So you need to know about migration and flow. So I'm going to put up a conceptual hydrograph here, and really what you need to have some idea of is obviously within that, with an analysis, you work out some peak flows, and in that, you want to have an idea of when fish are moving. Now, some fish will actually just target the low flows. And, and there's, some, there's more and more data. In the last 20 years, I've seen a lot of good science produce more and more data. This, and this is where you need to have the conversations going between the engineers and the biologists. And some fish are amazing. They will just target that peak flow, that one in one year event. And it may be five days. So, so in fact, you know, John and I uh, you know, started with uh, the, the so 95% of flows. Actually, and, and now it's, it's quite variable. In, in some systems, you might use 50% 50, 50 of flows. And in some, you, you've got to go for the one in five year events because they're critical ecological events. Some of these fish do for 20 years, they may not spawn for four, and then bang, they go. So some events you need to cater for. Now, if you're having that conversation, so, so the biologist and engineer talking about you know, what you're trying to achieve, what your functional objectives. If you let function drive design, you end up in some interesting places. Sometimes you end up saying, well, you know, if we need to accommodate this high flow and this low flow, there's two fishways better than one. Sometimes two fishways are cheaper. And that's happened in many cases. So that's happened in, I don't know, four cases at least, where two fishways are cheaper than one. So you just let function drive so, and some fish will migrate on the recession, and then some actually just migrate on temperature, independent of flow. And, and that's quite good because you know, no matter what flows are happening, they're, they're just turning up and they're really very, very flexible in you know, species. So, and, and look, you, you, ask, um, you ask a scientist, you, know, you might take this diagram and say, look, this is what I need. Can you tell me when these fish move? And he'll say, look, I don't know. You, and, and you need to have some idea. So this is a model. In other words, a model is your best understanding. So you need to drive you know, this conversation and get your best understanding because you will set up criteria, you will set up levels of concrete. And once that's done, 
that model is locked in. So you are the drive model, or the biologist does. So you know you have to have that dialogue and, and lots of questions you know, between each other. So you've got that background information, and now you've got a structure. You've got upstream and downstream water levels, minimum and maximum. This is your these are your building blocks. So you've got the biology, you've got a structure, upstream and downstream water levels. You need to interrogate that data, and you will need to. Look at, I, I look at it personally, I look at the raw data, I look at the raw daily data, I look at anomalies in it, and the engineer's doing the same because th this can be very cost sensitive and it, it can hit you down some strange tangents. If the gauge is not quite right, you might need to sort of, uh, look at those again um, to look at how they've changed. And sometimes you have no data and, and you know, it's a brand new site. And so you, you, might, you might model that structure. But I, I would say that one thing here is, if, yeah, if that was unknown, be a bit conservative. And because when, once you fix the length of a fishway, if the river drops a foot, maybe the whole fishway doesn't work. If it drops you know, half a minute, maybe it doesn't work. So two things here that have happened uh, for me is erosion of the tide water downstream. Even if the history has been no erosion for 100 years. So if something happens, there's an erosion. If you have a bedrock control, okay, that's fine. And the second thing, obviously, is climate change. So just assume that 100 years of record is insufficient. Uh, look, look at your you know, best and worst case scenarios of climate change. So a recent fishway I did um, in Western Australia, they were very concerned about it, so we actually, in the fishway, made it adjustable. So it was a vertical soft fishway with adjustable templates. So for they come back for $2,000, if they have half a dis discharge in the future, they're just changing inserts and change the battles. So, you know, you need to have that on the agenda. I, I'd also suggest if you get a tender or if you're working with a client, and he says, you know, I want X fishway, here's the data. If you start to add, you know, well, you know, we will consider climate change, we'll consider erosion, it means you're, you're thinking around the topic as well, you're not just answering the brief. Um, the simple thing is to make the fishway a little bit longer, a little bit deeper, and just for hydraulics. So, so round about now also, I'd like to include a design criterion that it's nice to achieve. You want fish attracted to this fishway. A, a good criterion is to get 10% of river flow. This, is, this comes from Europe and North America where they have you know, temperate rivers with pretty consistent flow. And they want 10% of river flow of fish passage going through your, through your fishway. Sometimes in Australia, you end up with 100%. The tidal barrier, 100% of the flow is going through that fishway. So it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't work all the time. Um, and on extremely high flows, you might be 1%. But just something to think about. So you now have your biology, your migration. You've got some understanding of when fish are moving. And it will be different in each river system. It will be different within the river system. So, so the time limit, sometimes very, very low flows. Uh, I mean, I remember set with John at, at Penrith, and incredibly low flows. And you're like, how's a juvenile fish that turned up, juvenile bass? So there are certain you know, flows that will change the fish passage through that river system and then between river systems. And obviously between the coast and the Murray Darling, if you work in Queensland, or if you work in the Mekong, this changes. But you'll end up with probably a range. So you sometimes it'll be a high priority and you'll just you'll drown you will design to drown out and others you, you won't you may have a very highly compromised function. Um, so one I did near the airport at Chirella is in, is in one of the cheapest fish I, I, I did and it was the council said look we've got very little money and I said well if we can do this operates just for the top quarter of the tide but it was a very urban stream uh, you know, there was a few species that were moving 30% operation in that site that conservation value was probably about right. So you need to yes, again to interrogate what Objectives are conservation values. Now, I'm, 
you, so you've integrated these things. You're talking, you're having this discussion about different fish by options, and you come to hydraulics. And this includes all those categories, yams and roughness. I want to talk about two in particular because they're quite important and you end up focusing on them a bit and there are some um, traps for the players, I think. Velocity and turbulence. So maximum velocity in a fishway, a full-time fishway, is determined by a difference in water level head loss. There's a nice little formula for that. And um, very widely used, uh, very accurate, very predictive. And it gives you maximum velocity if the vernier contractor just goes through the slot. So just downstream the slot. Now turbulence. So, so people are focused on water velocity, swimming speed. So turbulence, the energy of the water going into that pool creates this turbulence. The fish have to negotiate that. So the energy from that slot, which is discharge, it's head loss, over that pool volume. And that's measured in Watts per cubic meter. Now, that that criterion is is, uh, is used, you know, all the time with velocity. It's become again very predictive in terms of fish passage. So you can't have one without the other. And uh, and, 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 they, and they interact a bit. In fact, you could have a slightly higher velocity and lower turbulence and, and vice versa. Um, but the, the reason it's important is. Um, if we look at that top diagram, that has the same velocity, if you like, same maximum velocity as the bottom diagram. And that fish weight is shorter and cheaper. <coughs> the first cut is way more desirable. But, so same maximum velocity, but this bottom one obviously has double the turbulence. You've got the same energy entering the pool, but very high turbulence. And in fact, so the fish weight is built from uh, about 1910 in Australia, we're in 1927 until you know, the early 80s in Australia suffered a bit from this. There, there are a few out there that, that were effective, but most there wasn't an understanding of turbulence and, and the biology engineers working for well, the meat velocity criteria, they're okay. So there's a lot of very steep old fish ones around there because there's actually this mistake has been made in lots of countries. It's actually been made in the US, it's been made in South Africa, it's been made in Turkey. Portugal, it's a common mistake. Or actually, I'd say a common mistake in the past. So in this area now, there's a good understanding of turbulence. Now, I mentioned uh, watts per cubic meter. So it's an average figure, of course. So there's now lots of CFD modeling. This is a uh, modeling done by Willie Parsons, managed by Public Works. And looking at different variations of the vertical clock fishway. So the same average turbulence. The natural fact, if you start to play around with roughness, obviously the flow pattern's are different, the turbulence is different. Although the average number, lots of cubic meters is the same. So it's not, um, it's a, just remember it's an average figure. And, uh, it, and if you start to uh, change things around, you won't necessarily get the same fish passage uh, result. So in, in this particular case, I think the most probably found the columns have poor potential, but the wall roughness was, was high potential. But the key here is it's still measured as an average. So if you like, if, if I give a velocity criteria, if I give a head loss of 100 millimetres and 40 watts criteria, that criteria has to actually go with that design, with a physical 3 by 2 metre pool or whatever. You know, it, so you can't tease out those three things. It has to go with a specific uh, physical design. Um, so this is, uh, again, uh, velocity. In this case, you know, that velocity, that measurement you get from head loss, which is uh, quoted quite often, people will take that uh, maximum velocity and then reinterpret it. So really just stick to head loss as per the, you know, the various guidelines around. But within that slot, of course, you're getting a whole range of losses. And you're getting you know, losses just upstream and downstream that, that are highly different. And actually, through the fishway, you sometimes get pulses going through the fishway as well. So this, this is a dynamic you know, environment. But, the, but there's good criteria around it, but uh, just realise what assumptions that, uh, that criteria is it's making. It. 
the moment that those floor rocks are being applied, some sites uh, with uh, mixed success really, uh, but you know, the denser around the slot, which is what is the part of that. Um, this is another model of a sharp edge vertical slot, and which essentially showed us there were low velocities either side of the slot. So the fish could just get around fast velocity in a very short distance. And that's also been applied uh, in quite a few sites. Okay, so that, that's giving you this, this overview of, uh, of the fish weight types, how you might, how you have to integrate biology and hydrology and hydraulics. And now we're going to talk about these two components of design. And in fact, actually, I'm just going to talk about, let me finish off on this number one fish weight entrance, attraction design. And, and essentially, it's no fish in or no fish out. They don't find the fish way, and they, they can't do <coughs> that. So this is the last component I'm, I'm going to talk about. And um, there are two principles here. Fish will swim the absolute limit of migration, and the fish way flow needs to be easily detectable, not masked by turbulence. And that works pretty well. So this is a Penrith weir, um, and you can see it's notched beside the fishway entrance, the fishway entrance in the yellow box there, and we have the path of fish here, they'll be attracted by the high flow, and they're right up against that flow, and there's the entrance. And it's in a quiet, uh, low turbulent area, quite distinguishable. And that is actually video, the same thing. <laughs> Uh, same principle, and again, this is one by Heath Robinson. Uh, is this Lake Jellico? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, you can see how fish will, will move their way up to that, uh, that entrance. Uh, just another one by Heath on the, on the Murray. And uh, in this case, the point here is operating the gates is important. So, so you have to include the operator in that discussion and, uh, and operate those gates will attract fish to that, uh, that entrance. Um, you know, I've got a few more slides, actually. <laughs> yeah, you've got a short talk, Matt. <laughs> no, actually, I, I think I've only a couple of points. Look, physical modeling has been a powerful tool in getting the entrance right. I, I, I have, I've been working in this area a long time. I've worked with very experienced engineers. And you can never 100% predict what that water flow is going to be like. So physical modelling has been, um, that was another video, physical modelling has been a very powerful tool. Uh, this is some CFD modelling by GHD for Baron Weir. Again, that, that's um, a, a powerful tool, but, but my, my use of it is that in a physical model, I can stick my hand in there and move bits of plywood around and bricks, and I'm getting instantaneous response, it's very intuitive. And I can make you know, five changes in 20 seconds. CFD, you set it up and you run it. You obviously get limited by a number of you know, iterations, but uh, I think you know, huge potential you know, in this area. It'll just get better and better. Okay, I might skip through these, but um, there, there's, there's a port, this is Paradise Dam. There's just one important point here to make. If, if you went to this site, you'd see this fish lift and you think, that's spectacular, wow, that's amazing. Look at all the design the fish lift. But actually, there's, there's a huge amount of design around it. So the spillway axis, the spillway, uh, the shape of the spillway, the stilling basin, the abutments, the out networks, the gates in the out networks, the rock retaining wall, all of that is designed to guide the fish to this fishway. And in fact, you know, in a project, half of my time is about attraction design. Even though you think it's all about passage from the hydraulics, which is like the comfort zone of everyone. The, the entrance design, it's unique every single time and incorporates a lot of things. So I'm, I'm going to get through to my conclusion if I can. Because that, that just really, oh, no, I'm pretty quick here. Oh, I'm going to have to put the sit my second last slide in. Okay, uh, yeah. So if all that's complicated, think like a fish. And and, and really, yeah, you, you get a bunch of fishermen uh, at a weir, and, and, and they know when the migrating fish turn up. It's picked up and you know already. So think like a fish. 
and Okay, my conclusions, yeah, different fish ray types, different water level. So, so in, if you get a brief that says, I want a bird with a slot fish ray, actually what they want is fish passage, they may not want a bird with a slot fish ray. You need to know what the headwater and the tailwater is, and a whole bunch of other factors in. So you're trying to achieve fish passage to improve fish populations. Different fish ray types do, do different things, and they also have different levels of O and M, and that is obviously uh, pretty sensitive. That design process, Biology, hydrology, hydraulics, attraction design. Yeah, well, it's been half my time on that. Um, and my conclusion, it's a team approach. Now, it, it's actually a, a little bit simplistic, so I've just filled that out a little bit because what, what I mean is from the moment the project starts, you want to be having a conversation between engineers and biologists. So right from when the attender comes in or when the client approaches you, you want to be a team from that moment on. Science section, in background data, checking each other. And then internally, you want to have a couple of, a couple of workshops, you know, uh, to, to workshop concepts. Um, and you might want to do that at least a few times, depending on the size of the project. Yeah, no questions are dumb questions. Really, you just want to get a really good communication going. If, if I'm intensively working on a job, you know, with some of the people in this room, Really, we are apart from the face-to-face -face workshops, we'll be on the phone you know, every second day with questions. And uh, you know, I don't know all the engineering aspects, and uh, there's always some new biology to know along the way. And just consider the assumptions and risk. You'll end up m making binary decisions about absolute criteria, but they will have different assumptions and risks associated with them. Final message: Actually, it's never really a cookbook. You know. You, I can give you vertical slot criteria, I can give you rock mount criteria, but every site's unique, every solution's unique, and that's what is a huge fun of it. I love every single site. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll let you.